Today we're dealing with allergies, asthma and bad hair, but I want to bring you my booktube prize reviews and rankings. Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and that is exactly what I am going to do. I haven't yet done a video for my booktube prize reading this year. I never talked about the Octofinals books and it's actually been quite a substantial time since then, considering we've had another round. But if you would like me to discuss these books many months after that first part of the booktube prize, then do let me know. I stole the format for my reviews and rankings from Sarah over at Hardcover Hearts two years ago now. And the booktube prize is run by Robert of Barter Hordes and is all about um, booktubers, book reviewers, uh, anywhere you might discuss books online, folk coming together and judging what we believe is the best book published, I believe, in 2021. Firstly, what I'm going to do is run through the books that I had to read for the quarterfinals. I was judging fiction group A and the books in this section were What Strange Paradise by Omar al Akkad, The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers, The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki, Bewilderment by Richard Powers, and The Magician by Com Tobin. What I'm going to do is I am going to discuss my thoughts on these books and then give my rankings once I've done so. I may also do some separate videos discussing certain books with them being heftier and maybe I have opinions I feel like I can go into more depth with in another video. I haven't decided yet. However, going in order, we have What Strange Paradise Book by Omar al Akkad. This is a book that I believe that a lot of people are going to find somewhat emotional and heartrending. So this book begins with bodies washing up on the shore and you have this character of Amir, despite people believing that he must have died as well, isn't. And then you have this teenage girl called Mana. Going off what the blurb wants you to believe. What Strange Paradise is the story of our collective moment in this time, of empathy and indifference, of hope and despair, and of the way each of those things can blind us to reality or guide us to a better one. Now, whoever wrote that blurb is certainly doing a all right job of encompassing what this novel is going to be about, and unfortunately I am not the type of person who likes to read fiction about these sorts of events. I knew going into this book that I wasn't going to like this book. I did not care for the writing style straight away off the bat. I found that it was too all-encompassing and I know that sometimes you will have these omniscient narrators that are discussing everything and the way that al Akkad discusses uh, a scene and sets it all up is it's very focused on every detail. He wants you to recognise that this looks like this specifically and this looks like this specifically and in the beginning I found it really difficult to find any sort of focus. I didn't know where I as the reader was supposed to be looking within this narrative and maybe that's what the author was trying to do. He was trying to go for this almost photographic style to begin this novel but from the outset then I started feeling badly about this book, thinking that I wish it had more of a focus in terms of character in this scene. Now I understand also why this is happening, because it's kind of like the widening coming in and into the smaller focus of this one child on the beach, but the way that it was written felt too chaotic for me. Overall, the style didn't work for me. It, at times I felt as though the novel was trying to make me feel things in too much of a way. It was over-egging the pudding to a certain extent. In terms of the story, I felt as though it was very much a story that we have seen before. Now, I think that in narrative terms, it is intriguing to see this discussed in fiction. And I think that when we look at other books that have come out, around a similar topic, I have had a similar reaction to them. And it all goes back to 
me reacting negatively towards books that almost feel as though they're trying to force this emotional impact because I can tell and I know that what the characters are going through is a very real thing and that I can already sympathise with their plight and how awful their situation is without having to try and force the issue. And I'm not asking for a piece of prose to be emotionless. I'm perhaps asking for the writer to take a step back and consider the way the words that they're using and not insert too much of their own feeling into the narrative so that I can properly look at how the characters are actually feeling as opposed to how the author is feeling about a certain situation, which is how I felt here. Then we have The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, which is a book that I read a few months ago and I particularly liked at the time. This follows Tucky, who works in a bookshop having just been released from prison for committing a crime that she supposedly didn't realise that she was committing. The library is being haunted by the ghost of one of their former customers who was a bit of a busybody. Then you deal with Tucky trying to deal with this ghost and also perhaps gain some reparations for things that have happened to her in the past. This book dealt with a lot and I have seen many criticisms since I reviewed the book uh, with in relation to how the book is set in a specific moment. So this is set from All Souls Day 2019 to All Souls Day in 2020 and obviously a lot happened in Minneapolis where the book is set indeed in the world in 2020. And this book does include discussion of Covid and discussion to the murder of George Floyd. When this happened and I read this book originally I had a bit of a moment where I stopped reading because I didn't know how I felt about it but ultimately I liked the idea that the world events were impacting on the novel because I felt like it connected in a way to lives aren't novels and you can be dealing with your own thing and your own issue and worldwide or local events can come in and your own issues have to take a step back from that and I do think that maybe Erdrich could have taken some time and wove the stories together a bit better and I think that uh, there was a bit of an issue here in terms of pulling all of the narrative threads together so that they fit. However, I particularly like the book. Then we move on to The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers and this is a book that left me decidedly conflicted. Now this one I actually chose to do as a buddy read. Now I know in the grand scheme of things with the Book Due Prize we aren't supposed to discuss things so this is why I buddy read it with somebody who has nothing to do with the Book Due Prize. She don't have an horse in this race. The book starts with this ancestral voice discussing life on a specific piece of land and the indigenous people that live there and then moves forward to this young girl, Ailey, who's telling the novel from her perspective. And it goes, it's a family saga, and it encompasses not just the lives of Ailey and her family navigating their lives, but also goes back in time to tell you about ancestors' lives. Then it'll come forward in time and tell you about recent ancestors before going back in time and telling you about the older ancestors again. And I have to admit, I did wonder where this story was going. At about the page 300 mark, I was able to appreciate the writing of this, but I felt like there wasn't really much sense of where the novel was going. And there was this part of me that, whilst reading, I ended up switching to the audiobook whilst I was driving to work. And it's only whilst listening to the audiobook and hearing the way that the story is told that I began to recognise that 
the way a lot of people tell their family stories, there is this almost grandiloquence about it. There is this, uh, you, you can be telling a story in the present day and then you'll flip back to the past and discuss what happened with this relative and the way things went on there to then discuss another matter that is happening in the present day because I was getting annoyed by a certain repetitive nature during the midsection of this novel and then I realised through discussion that maybe it's discussing the cyclical nature of things and the way that even though parents will try and prevent their children from making mistakes they can never have a proper handle on things. It does a good job of showing all the ways that these relatives interact with each other and link together. There are characters who I think might not have been as well drawn as they could have been but they are side characters and whilst they might have close relationships within the grand scheme of the entire narrative, in contrast to the Omar al Akkad, the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois does have a focus in the character of Ailey and even though you do get told these other stories towards the end you begin to understand why these stories are being told and everything begins to fit together. I also had to think of it in the scheme of looking at Dickens and looking at all of these spiralling stories um, from the past uh, which were primarily being told by these grandiloquent wh white men. I had to look at what Jeffers or what was getting at when she went into writing this novel and I think that here you have a book that whilst I don't think sometimes the writing is at its strongest or whilst I still think there could have been some fine tuning in places, I do think that it's a wonderful, rewarding read and it, it manages to tell many stories whilst also centering it on a character and also recognising that sometimes as people we can end up carrying the stories of our entire families within us. I know from my own perspective I've wondered at times what I'm going to do with the 150 years worth of stories I've been given throughout my life because I fear that there are people who won't be interested in them and it's, you just you know that these things happened and you know that certain events happened over a century ago and you're the only person who might be left with that knowledge in one day and I certainly felt Ailey's difficulty in understanding and navigating all of that. Then we have The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. Benny's father is killed at the beginning of this novel and at this point it marks a shift for Benny and his mother. Benny's mother begins hoarding and Benny himself starts to have some possible mental health struggles. He begins hearing the emotions and the voices from certain objects. This book follows them in their grief and follows them throughout the years as this ability of Benny's to hear what objects are saying begins to perhaps spiral out of control. As somebody who regularly seeks out books on grief, the book of form and emptiness is one that spoke to me and I kind of flew through. It's a book that dealt with themes that I am particularly partial to. It is weird sometimes and I recognise that it might not be a book for everybody but it is a book that almost emulated certain events that had gone on in my own life after the death of my grandfather when I was 10 and it was this connection that I was pulling and this parallel here that really helped me to emotionally connect with the character of Benny within this novel. I think that 
oftentimes when we're looking at young people and sometimes when we're looking, I mean, things might have changed now, uh, but 20 years ago when I was dealing with my own grief, there was very much this idea of, well, they're young, they'll get over it. So almost forgetting any sort of emotion that might have been felt. The way this book is constructed, so you have this book that is telling Benny's story and you also have Benny interacting with this book throughout the novel giving it this almost meta narrative so you have this idea of narrator Benny and these other stories that are going on that are all going to come together in the end to help tell this narrative it is a tale of family in grief and having heard stories of the struggles with mental health care in America, there is discussion of that within this book. Uh, there is discussion of Benny's mother's hoarding and the way she is almost holding on to everything from before her husband's death, as though this is going to connect her to him, but also keep her connected to a world that no longer exists for her. It worked for me in its weird moments and it worked for me in the way that it had this sense of unreality about everything. It is a book that I will be going back and rereading. Seeing the David Mitchell quote on the back seemed fitting to me because as a reader of David Mitchell and someone who has enjoyed his work in the past, I can see how these two work, two books, uh, I can see how these two writers are almost writing in the same sort of field of an almost uh, metaphysical, uh, weird science fiction type of prose. That makes no sense at all, but that's how I feel. I felt like if you enjoyed David Mitchell as I did, then you'll enjoy this book. I can tell, I know that certain readers aren't going to enjoy this book, and I can understand why they wouldn't. Uh, but for me, I was particularly impressed. And then you have Bewilderment by Richard Powers, which currently stands as my most hated book of the year. <laughs> so here you have the narrator, whose name I can't even remember, whose son is called Robin. And here you're dealing with death as well. Now that's one of the interesting things to do with all of these books, is that there has been some aspect of death and or grief within the writing. There has been discussion of this struggle and they have all dealt with family in some sort of way, be that found family or a family saga as with the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Richard Powers is discussing a boy called Robin whose mother has died and throughout you have this sense that Robin might be on the autistic spectrum, although that is never properly defined within the scope of the narrative. And I have spoken to other people since reading this book, specifically in relation to the representation in this book, because to me, it rubbed me the wrong way. But I have heard that certain people believe that it's good representation, and certain people believe that it's not. Now, Richard Powers leans into the science fiction aspect here a bit and has Robin enter into this clinical trial where he is put in, connected to some sort of machine that has his mother's voice there and she is showing him how to behave and how to move past certain emotions. This comes after he has harmed a fellow student at school. Alongside this you have the discussion of nature and there's a lot of nature writing in here that could be beautiful but this is even worse than Omar al-Akkad because at least with that writer there were moments of understanding within the prose. There were moments where I wasn't hating every moment that I spent in that book. It's just, you know, that's not a book that I hated. I can understand why people would like it. I'm just not one of them. With Richard Powers, I can't understand why anybody likes Bewilderment. 
It's one of the ones that made me irate the entire time that I was listening to this book. I hated how Powers would have the father describe his son as an alien, describe him as inhuman or not human, who wouldn't even try to understand his son in any way, who f sometimes failed to recognise that his son might be grieving even though his son might have um, some sort of neurodivergency. Then the ending. So yeah, I hated the ending of this. I thought that it was a cop-out. I feel as though it was Powers saying that he had absolutely no idea where to go with this novel from now on. So what he's going to do is he's just going to end it here, do what he did, have three pages as though they're an epilogue and then end things. It was total horseshit. So you can guess where that's going to be on my rankings. And then we have The Magician by Kwam Toibin, whose name I still haven't learnt how to pronounce. But this is following the life of Thomas Mann from childhood to adulthood, living through the Great War, the Second World War, and also discussing his life as he grew older and he wrote his books. I didn't know much about Thomas Mann before going into this book. A friend of mine lent me The Magic Mountain many moons ago and I never got around to reading it. And I did have a copy of Death in Venice but I returned it to the shop unread because I didn't think that I would ever get around to reading it. And now, having read The Magician, I want to read more of Thomas Mann's work. So here we have a book that is told in a very staid pace. I don't know how to describe it other than delicate. The author writes the novel in a rather gentle manner and it almost feels as though you're just coming along for the ride and it just ebbs away and it flows and it was magnificent. It is a book that discussed man's homosexual feelings and how they came to influence his novels. It discussed a man who perhaps felt as though he didn't fit in the world and it also discussed his family and somehow the author has managed to create a portrait of somebody that feels incredibly real and discusses these struggles in just I'd like to say a masterful manner really because I didn't feel as though I had to worry about where this novel was going. Of course what we have here is a fictionalised biography of an author which the or this author has done before. It just felt very tender and careful and it made me want to read the author. I felt a connection with this writer from over a hundred years ago from within the last hundred years that and this is someone that I know nothing of and everything within here could be completely false. I don't think it is. I believe that the author of this did actually do a meticulous amount of research on it. You get to see how a man stayed silent in the First World War. You get to see a man recognise that his silence is damaging and recognise the power of his own words and recognise the ways to behave with certain audiences and certain people. Uh, you get to see a man come into his own even if it takes him quite a long time. You get to see him go various through various changes in his life and his relationships with his children. You get to see how maybe the relationships he has with his children aren't as good as he thinks they are. You get to see a book in which there is tragedy and there is death but it is not sensationalised and yet it still packs a punch because it does come out of nowhere and it's a book that doesn't necessarily go in for this whole thing of leading up and huge climaxes. It is a book that remains steady because, and in its steadiness it almost portrays real life. It's a book that it, to use a metaphor here, which Northern, we don't tend to go for that, it's very much swan, legs underwater apparently moving faster than usual, you know. It's a bit like a hippopotamus. You don't look at a hippopotamus and think that's going to 
um, be able to launch itself at you. That's it. This book is a hippopotamus. Actually, I think I've just got a thing about the word hippo at the moment. This just felt very well written, very well crafted and was a bit of a dream and a breeze to read through as somebody who's began to appreciate slower, more thoughtful fiction as of late. And them's the books, so I suppose now we ought to get on to my rankings. In what will be no surprise to anybody, in at number six you have Bewilderment by Richard Powers. Then you have What Strange Paradise by Omar al Akkad. Then we have The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Coming in at number three, I put The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. Number two, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. And coming in at number one, I had The Magician by Kum Toibin. So, out of my top three, two books made it through to the next round of the Booktube Prize. Uh, the Book of Form and Emptiness didn't, but I can understand why it didn't, because I don't think that this is a book for everybody. I was just happy to see Richard Powers get kicked out. The fact that he made it through to the quarterfinals astonished me, and I couldn't go back and watch anybody's videos about this, because it's, this is one of those books where no matter what anybody says to me about it, I will disagree with them. I was happy with Louise Erdrich making it through to the semi-finals because I did enjoy the sentence and there was really a top four here. I knew which books were going to be in the top four and with Bewilderment being so terrible uh, when it came round to What Strange Paradise, it would have had to have done something fantastic and that was the last book that I listened to. And What Strange Paradise would have had to have done something fantastic to surpass any of the books that I was reading. And unfortunately, for me, it didn't. As I say, there are many people who love that book. It just, it would never have been a book for me and I can deal with that. It was just a bewilderment made me angry throughout the entire reading experience. There was nothing within the writing that I liked. There was, as I say, the, the nature writing... Maybe I didn't. Did, did I like the nature writing? I didn't. I didn't like the nature writing because I felt like it was too preachy. But this isn't the review portion. This is the ranking portion. I could rant about Richard Powers and Bewilderment all day. Like, honestly, reading Bewilderment by Richard Powers might make me go and read Wuthering Heights again. And I don't like Wuthering Heights. Either way, this book right here sent me out picking up books by the author, picking up books by Thomas Mann. I might even be making a somewhat extravagant purchase by from work for some collected stories by the author, by Thomas Mann. So, you know, Come to Bin did a rather splendid job with that book. Now, in terms of individual videos that I'd been considering doing with regards to these books, not necessarily The Magician, because I think that I got across that I particularly enjoyed that one. But I have been considering making a single review video of the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Maybe asking for questions and that sort of thing. So do let me know whether that's something that you would be interested in. Indeed, do let me know whether you would like me to record a video about my very first round of the Booktube Prize this year, which was for translated fiction. I'll admit, some of the books are no longer on my shelves because I did end up donating them. Uh, some of those books might still be in the Booktube Prize, but yeah, if you want to hear my thoughts on them, let me know that as well. I'm quite lucky with the next round of the Booktube Prize because I already own two of the books. So for the next round, I will be reading Still Life by Sarah Winman and The Lincoln Highway by A. Mortels. And to hear my thoughts on them, you're going to have to come back here at the end of July. Maybe the start of August. I'm not quite sure yet. All I know is that by that time, I'm going to be another year older. And ugh, that's how long the Booktube Prize has been going on. It ages me. Anyway, I think that that's it for now. If you have read any of these books and would like to discuss them, please feel free to do so in the comments. If you liked Bewilderment by Richard Powers, then know that 
this was not an attack on your character. I did not care for that book. And do remember that opinions are like our souls. We don't have to share them. And until next time, that is all.